how many amp hours or watt hour batteries uh, amount of batteries do you think you're going to need to run any one of these 12 volt units? Mm. So comfortable. I mean, yeah. So, so the trick with that question, by the way, I'm isn't... asking you questions that pretty much get asked me on a daily basis. And I love yeah. that you are actually like thrown off because there's actually a really hard way to answer a yeah. open-ended question like that. Well, it seems really simple. It's just like, well, how it's much not... power do I need to run my AC? The key is how cold do you want it to be okay. and for how long? There's so, so, many, so there's so many follow-up questions to that simple question. Yeah. That... So, so for anybody watching in the future, if you want to ask this question and make an informed question so you get a, a, a proper answer, figure out, do you want it to be all night? How long can I run this AC for eight hours? And what is required to do so? So, hey, everybody, I'm here with Nick Nelson uh, from Exploration Vans. You dropped the works. I did. It was arduous. Uh, the third word apparently just was too much to handle. Fair enough. Guys, I do want to apologize for any uh, echoing or uh, the lack of my setup behind me as I literally just moved into my new place in Las Vegas, Nevada. I have not set up really anything. So with the exception of a brand new computer that I went out and bought for no reason at all. The reason why Nick is actually uh, on this call right now with me on Zoom and not in front of me and we're not talking about this is because he is roughly... 2,800 miles away in New Hampshire, maybe more, 3,000? Are you 3,000? Yeah. I'm just not flying to him to do a video about this. And I really wanted not to- yet. No, not yet. But okay. I really wanted to get this video out to the masses. Um, why? Because we are filming this in June. We just went through a heat wave here in Las Vegas. How, what's your temperature there? It was like 85 today. Yeah. It wasn't bad. Uh, humidity? Pretty humid? Uh, high. Yeah. Yeah. It's the Northeast. I get it. Nick actually uh, is a professional van builder. How many AC units have you installed? And it, like, not just nomadic cooling, which is what this video is about. Um, mm -hmm. But how many have you installed entirely? Six. Okay. How many yeah. nomadics have you done? Six. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have you, have you got your hands on any other 12 volt units like a cruising comfort or a uh, Dometic 12 volt or any, or like a zero breeze? Yeah, um, honestly, I've done a lot of research about zero breeze, the cruising comfort, as well as kind of the, the swamp style roof coolers. Ooh. That is, oh. yeah, what is it called again? Oh, the Fresairs? The Fresair. I saw one recently in use. Um, I did a mm -hmm. tour of a gentleman, uh, his name is Aaron, but the, the video hasn't come out yet. The tour hasn't come out yet. And uh, to be honest with you, it was actually really, it was, it was, it was better than I thought. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. And 80% humidity or like, this says it right there on their website, something like 70 something percent humidity. It just is, it's obsolete. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the exact numbers offhand and it doesn't have Freon in it or some sort of air cooling, whatever that stuff is inside. Yeah. Like a refrigerant. A refrigerant, right. Uh, yeah. To make it an actual air conditioner. But today's video is mostly going to be about the nomadic cooling unit, which you've done six of, like you said, put a bunch of overlays in this video of Nick actually yeah. installing it into a van. Uh, your yeah. late, one of your latest builds. These are luxury items. You know, Nick, you have traveled for quite a while. Uh, you've done a lot of van life stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you feel um, that an air conditioner is one of those necessary, uh, necess what's the word I'm looking for? Necessity? Necessary? Necessities? Yeah. No, I don't, I truthfully don't believe it's a necessary necessity. Okay. Um, I think when I think about designing a mobile space, I'm really thinking about like the two most important things, which is keeping you and everybody, humans, animals in the van, safe and comfortable. Right. And the key is kind of how can we manipulate the space to, to achieve that goal? And for some people, truthfully, a roof vent and like parking in the shade can achieve that. The issue is then what happens if you have a lot of components where you need to be parking in the sun for a lot of solar? Sure. Now you're just creating an oven. And so, you know, you need to bring those temps down. And so roof vents do a really good job of moving air, but it can only do so much of a good job we put these air conditioners in our vans to uh really just be comfortable at night i would say i mean when you're thinking about a, a in a mobile unit the air conditioner it doesn't it's not like in a house where like you set it to 60 and like that sucker brings it down to 60 you're looking at ambient temperature and trying to bring down the temp inside the van you know 20 30 degrees down from ambient which can be 100 degrees outside 
I'm actually really glad that you said that because it's really nice that um, I have you that has installed six of these and you got me that has actually installed a cruise and comfort. Um, mm. I don't think that we should pin them against each other because really they're two completely different machines. We can pin a nomadic cooling against a Fraser all day long. And we already know fair. one's here, one's down here. In regards to what you just said was having a mobile AC or a 12 volt AC is not like running an air conditioner in your house. It's actually mm -hmm. two very different situations. When I, when I installed my cruise in comfort, I was told by many other professional builders, the AC is there to take the edge off, mm -hmm. not to be running 24 seven. No. I'm glad you touched upon that because like for me, when I'm driving to my destination, I would actually run my factory AC off mm -hmm. of my van itself, cool the back space down. And then you would use that air conditioning unit to kind of keep it cool. Now I set my AC to, I think 80. Hmm. Yeah. How about what, well, you know, what, what, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? Why, why do you react like that? Oh, if it's 80, I can't sleep. Here's the thing. Like, for example, with the cruise of comfort, I had it set to 80, but it didn't feel like 80. It felt a mm -hmm. heck of a lot cooler than that. Maybe because yeah. we're in a, you know, 66 square foot space or whatever it is, 60 to 80 square foot space, depending on, you know, what van you're in. And the other thing I'd wonder in your van too, is so for the cruise and comfort is the interior like temp sensor, is it inside the controller? And where was that mounted? Because if it's mounted up by the ceiling, knowing cold air falls and the hot air is rising, it could be set to, you know, X amount of Fahrenheit. But because all the cold air is down where you are below the temp sensor, it'll always be colder. Okay. Well, actually, now I know for a fact you haven't installed a cruise and comfort uh, I haven't. With, with a van life tech system because yeah. we actually integrated the cruise and comfort with Troy's control pad. <laughs> Perfect. So ideally, it was perpendicular to an exterior wall at chest height, right? It was perpendicular uh, to an exterior wall at chest height. So it's still, hmm. you know, four feet off the ground. So okay. you're right, that cool air might still be sticking down there keeping Maybe. the van at a relatively cold environment, I guess, right? Mm. The difference between like a cruise and comfort, like we keep on talking about in a nomadic cooling unit is the cruise and comfort is a undermount and the nomadic cooling is a roof mount. Mm. Well, um, it's a split technically, right? The cruise the and comfort? Cruise, yeah. Yes. Uh, is the nomadic not a split? No. It is not, okay. So it is a centralized roof mounted unit that drops into an existing 14 by 14 hole, which is, if you don't know, the standard international standard for vents. So it could, you could take like a, a Max Air fan, pull it out and install an automatic in its place. That was my next question. We had a nice, the people that have built vans know that a Max Air fan is a 14 by 14 hole. Now, can you take a nomadic cooling unit and replace a factory AC? Let's say you buy a passenger van Mm. And you want to replace it with the, the passenger vans typically will come with an AC unit in the rear and it's mm -hmm. usually on the roof, but you can't run those unless the van is running itself. And okay. apparently they're really leaky. They are I very was, leaky. I was on like, yeah, I think it was a Sprinter Facebook group this morning when I probably should have been doing something more productive. And I was just reading all these things about how they constantly are leaking. Do, have you felt with the six uh, nomadic cooling units that you've installed, uh, do those leak? Do they have condensation issues? Yeah. Um, and, and there's kind of two little like tubes. It looks like um, a barb fitting that you could put hose on. Okay. And they're sticking out the rear of the unit on either side of it, which is nice because then what you can choose to do is take some hose, clamp it onto those and redirect that condensation somewhere maybe more helpful, like right off to the edge of the van. Otherwise it's going to just kind of pool along the top. If you install a nomadic cooling or a cruising comfort or whatever AC you really want to, I highly, highly recommend putting it where you're going to sleep. In the, in the Sprinter specifically, there's like the second most forward position. And there's actually, if you looked on a Sprinter, there's a little circle, uh, like a dimple, a raised circle. That's where you've got a clean 14 by 14, basically. Okay. Um, but in the, in the back, you have to, to use like an adapter of sorts. Actually, so going the... back to your question, because you brought up can you replace a factory AC unit with a nomadic, say like Correct. on a sprinter, and you cannot without a little bit of help. So the hole is much, much bigger. 
That's what I was getting at. Yes, the hole yes. is much, 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 much so, bigger. So what you would need to do is use, for example, a, a replacement um, panel that is CNC cut, built to contour to the ridges, and then fit right in that place and takes a big hole and makes a 14 by 14. And this is made by the same company that you would purchase like a, an adapter or even like a normal roof end. And they make an adapter to go from the factory AC to a 14 by 14. Can you buy that off of like nomadic cooling? Have they, have they put that in their shelves yet? It should that, be. That adapter? It, it, would either be it, it would either be in their store or they know they have a link to the company that makes these. You really can only put this AC unit comfortably in like where you have it or like at that second most position in the front. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in that install specifically that I sent you, the client asked for it to go one roof rib space forward of where I would normally put it just because he's, so he's installed an adventure wagon kit. He has two sets of Moab beds, one low and one really high for his kids. So oh, he didn't want I to turn it. them okay. into like popsicles and put them within inches of the AC. So he put it slightly forward just so it's not blowing right on that. Now, have you installed them on uh, only 144s or 170s or? Mostly 170s, yeah. Okay. I believe the 144s have the same roof configuration or it's obviously more extended Nearly. in a 170 yeah. than it is a 144, but it's roughly the same. I think there's one extra rib in a 170 is, is pretty much. Regardless, I've seen these nomadic cooling units on uh, all three major brands, which would be uh, Transit Sprinter and uh, Promaster. Before we get into some other install questions, uh, I've got a question for you, Nick. I, I do want to let everybody know that Nick is a certified marine electrician. Did you have to pay a bunch of money for that? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, like you do any certification, right? You, you yep. pay the fees to the organization, which is the... So my certification... Uh, is through the ABYC, which is the American Boat and Yacht Council, which is uh, kind of the major certifying body in the United States that works directly with the United States Coast Guard to create, implement, and then constantly reinvent marine standards for, for systems like bilges and galleys all the way to, to electrical as well. All right. So why is it important to have that certification for van life? Mm. Well, so, I mean, everyone's heard of like the term like land yacht right? Like yes, it's, it's a boat with wheels, I, I'd assume, which is very rude of me. But, but so truthfully, what a van is, it's a boat. The only thing that we don't have is the fact that the van's not sitting in salt water. Mm -hmm. But everything else about it is identical to marine electrical standards, just because it's a, it's a mobile vehicle without you know, a consistent and reliable ground that goes into the ground. It's always moving, which means it's high vibration, and especially it's predominantly 12 volt, or it's predominantly direct current, um, 12, 24, 48, exactly. Yeah, so, so whereas in residential, where most people are familiar with 120 volt alternating current. So the reason why a certified marine electrician is so valuable in the van industry to me is because it's the closest thing to a certification in the exact electrical systems in vans. And any residential journeyman or certified electrician isn't familiar with these systems right they they know them they're just mm -hmm. not they're just not as familiar as somebody as yourself that has that has obviously a lot of extensive um certification tests all that good stuff uh i just wanted to put that out there to make sure everybody understands that i'm not talking to some just random professional builder i'm talking to a certified marine electrician what is really cool about the nomadic cooling units and other 12 volt units is it's mm -hmm. not just in 12 volt. It comes in another yeah. voltage, which is 24 volt. Just we are going to do a completely separate video with you, how systems work, I guess, because uh, we should actually sit down with you and do another, maybe when I actually see you in person, is a good segue <laughs> into our pitch, uh, into, into what I was about to say. Um, Nick is actually, uh, has joined the van building team on Gutted, which is a, a, van, is a competition event as well as a gathering which is a van versus a schoolie versus an RV build. And there's seven people per team. And we have five days to build this monstrosity. It's crazy. I'm looking forward to it. However, Nick has been the last addition to that team. Uh, thanks to uh, your boy here. I know for me and Nick, we're very competitive and we, we are, it's going to be a friendly competition guys, but uh, that was kind of the segue into uh, Nick being part of the gutted, uh, van building team 
and uh, he's going to be meeting us out in Colorado. Uh, again, mm-hmm. like I said, it is going to be a gathering. So if you do want your tickets, uh, please uh, go to either my website or go to the gutted website, uh, guttedevents.com and pick up your tickets because you can actually watch us build this thing live, which is going to be ridiculous. And we're Crazy. Gonna, it's going to, it's going to be a fantastic event uh, and hopefully years to come after this. So uh, I'm excited to be part of it. And uh, I think these, uh, the guys that are orchestrating this, they have no idea what they're in for. All right. So back to the nomadic cooling unit, which I, yeah, uh, nomadic cooling. Uh, yeah. Nomadic cooling. Uh, mm. so you can get it in tw- tw- 12, obviously you can get it in 24. Stuff. Their website just said, uh, you know, can be powered by 12, 24 or 48 volt batteries. Okay. Do you think these, um, not to get too, into too much detail with electrical, but electrical mm. and AC kind of go hand in hand. Do you think yeah. that uh, these battery companies, uh, the Relions of the world, which are my favorite, the Lions, mm. which are you know second to me, and then Battleborn, which is a distant third. Do you think these people that are mm. providing these batteries, do you think they're eventually going to come up with a standard 24 volt or a 48 volt battery instead of mm. just doing a 12 volt battery? Well, well, and that's fun that you say that because they already do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, Reliant, which is the company that I install in my vans as well, because uh, I like blue matches my eyes. But oh, um, blue and but, green. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Did you just hit on every viewer? I hit on this? you. <laughs> no, I'm already taken. Sorry. But um, but so truthfully though, they're already available in 24 and, and 48 as well, and so you can just have less batteries all connected together okay. and just have like two mama luke batteries and you know to quote george from humble road instead of like 12 little ones which is really nice you know because then it's less cables to connect all these little batteries gotcha so again less cost less weight but less work to crimp everything and it's just simpler so nick um the reason why i was talking about power consumption earlier was because you know I, and i know you're about to touch on this with the question i'm going to ask I'm going to ask you what the hardest part of the install is, the process of it. But also, I want you to touch upon um, these do have pretty big amperage draws on them, these these units, mm. whether it's a nomadic, whether it's a cruising comfort, no matter what it is, a dometic, uh, king tech, no matter what it is, it's an AC unit that is going to have the biggest power draw out of everything in your van. Yeah. Uh, even more so than, than I guess, a, a uh, an induction cooktop. Yeah. I mean, an induction, I mean, they're pretty close, but an induction is you only use it for X amount of time where you want to be running, you know, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it, so the average, like 11,000 BTU um, heater, which is like the nomadic 3000. I mean, that's going to be using, you know, 120 amps total. So that's massive. Yeah. But, but when you're thinking of like, you know, based on water, that's on full blast. Yeah. Okay. So that's at like full blast at like hundred degrees ambient. So yeah, that, that puppy is working as hard as possible. Yeah. And I did a, you know, I did a video a while back with my cruise and comfort and I, I put it on full blast after running the floors, which is the heating for, mm. I think it was an hour. And then I tried and I, and it was in a hundred degree weather in Portland. And then I ran the AC for an hour to see if I could get it down to 70. Uh, mm. I was successful. I think it was like 74 in the van is what it was reading. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I can maybe put footage of that up. It eventually slowed itself down because it was running at about, I think it was like 60 watts. Does the AC do that? Are they smart enough to, after it gets to a certain point, does the fans, you know, do like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not asking this properly, but like, mm-hmm. will, it, will it slow itself down if it's starting to cool down inside the van? Yeah, so, so it, it will know, it will recognize that the heat is starting to get close to your requested temperature and kind of calm down a little bit just because it, you know, it knows that to, to, to be constantly outputting at max amperage for that long is just not ideal for anybody. So it'll, it'll either bring you close to temp and then calm down or it will cycle on and off completely. Okay. Once you reach temp, because I know too, the, the nomadic specifically, it has a lot of fail states built in sensing the voltages of the batteries. So it will, adjust its scheme depending on the voltage if it gets really low it'll calm down or stop completely how many amp hours or watt hour batteries uh amount of batteries do you think you're going to need to run any one of these 12 volt units Mm. so comfortable i mean yeah so so the trick with that question by the way i'm asking you questions that pretty much get asked me on a daily basis and i love that you are actually uh like thrown off because there's actually a really hard way to answer a 
yeah. an ended question like that. Well, it seems really simple. It's just like, well, how much power do I need to run my AC? The key is how cold do you want it to be Thank and you. for how long? There's so, so, many, so there's so many follow-up questions to that simple question. Yeah. That so so for anybody watching in the future, if you want to ask this question and make an informed question so you get a, a, a proper answer, figure out, do you want it to be all night? How long can I run this AC for eight hours? And what is required to do so? Because, you know, you, you'll probably sleep eight hours maybe. So for example, like let's do some math. It'll be fun. So like if we're trying to run our nomadic, let's say like, you know, it's 85 out. So if it's 85 out, um, that'll be running at like 65 amps. So 65 amps for an hour is 65 amp hours, because that's literally what an amp hour is, is an, a, that amperage draw for 60 minutes. So 65 amps. You got a calculator then, right there? No, I'm writing this down. Oh. So 65 amps. And then let's say you're running that for eight hours. So that right there means 65 times eight. 520. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's I was right. So 520 amp hours okay. are needed to run that AC at half the amperage of maximum for night. Time. Okay, that's, well, that's my, my question to you, that is crazy. My question to you mm -hmm. is, you know, if you were going to be running an air conditioner, just like a refrigerator does, does it not cycle on and off during the eight hour span? So that's the nice thing. It probably will, but it depends on how hot is it outside? Is it just going to be constantly running because it physically can't achieve that temperature? So Nomadic did tests where they found in super, super hot temperature at 100% humidity in Florida that they the, the individual set the temp far too low and the unit was never able to cycle. It just kept working and working and working, physically never able to achieve that set temperature. What is way and, too low? Um, I'd say like 40 to 50 degrees below ambient. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So yeah, especially so, in like Florida, which is it's never going to achieve. Yeah, that. no, no. Like, like let's be honest. Like, if you're in Florida in July in 100 percent humidity, you've made so many mistakes that led you to this point. <laughs> just give up. Yeah. I don't care how cheap the Disney World tickets are. Don't do it. Yeah, uh, but but so truthfully, basically, what we're saying though is, you've got to to understand the equipment you have in your vehicle and understand its limitations and adjust your lifestyle you know, to be within those limitations of what you have. And I, I think trying people, to run your AC down to 70 in Florida in July isn't that. Is, it's it's not, not possible. No, I usually tell people if you, because let's face it, these lithium batteries are not cheap. You know, no. they can range anywhere between eight, 900, all the way up to, you know, uh, for a hundred amp yeah. hours, by the way. You're looking the at the $10. Yeah. $10 an amp hour is the average. Is the average. I ran my AC off of 400 amp hours, which mm. I still don't believe was enough. Is it possible? Of course it is. Is it yeah. going to, you have to, I, I, with 400 amp hours, I almost have to watch my gauges to make mm. sure 600. It's a little bit easier. So I usually tell people that 600 yeah. is sufficient, but if you're if obviously you want to be running it in July in uh, Florida, you're going to want mm. at least a thousand. You're going to want yeah. a crazy well, amount or even a 24 volt system or 48 volt system. Well and, well, and here's the thing, truthfully, is if you're going to be installing an AC unit in a vehicle and you're planning on using it a lot, the best insurance you can also add on that vehicle is a second dedicated alternator. Because is that, that is like the, a nation's alternator? Precisely. That's what I install. I install nation's alternator kits. And just like a van life tech, is the only thing that typically leaves in the vans in my shop. So does a nation's alternator. That's what you're suggesting. Maybe four to 600 amp hours and a nation's mm -hmm. alternator kit. I believe yeah. even at deplete at a depleted, you know, you know, four or six battery, you know, kit, mm -hmm. your nation's alternator can charge that bad boy up like what, two, three, four hours. Fast, yeah. really fast. Guys, uh, if your head has not exploded by this point in the video, then I, you've got issues. My head's about to explode. I, I can't, I hate electrical so much with so much a passion. Uh, I asked you a question earlier and you still haven't answered it, which is what is the Oops. most difficult part of the entire oh, yeah. SD install? Honestly, getting it to the top. <laughs> it's uh, hard. Did you, did you use a hoist? I haven't even looked at your videos. No, no. So I, I, I have like a baker's rack in my shop. And then uh, my, my girlfriend was, Jen was filming it. And then she like, we would stop filming and like, she'd help me like lift it up there. And, and it's not bad. It's not super duper heavy, but like, you don't want to drop it on your van. You yeah. don't want to drop it on the ground. So it's like, right. It's like walking on the sidewalk next to a cliff. 
you're not going to just like randomly fall off, but it's scary because you could screw up. So my brother actually has a Dometic penguin. Mm. If you know those are heavy are. too, I've heard. So what we did. Yeah, so actually, the Dometic I, penguin is 120 volt AC designed to is. just be run by being plugged into shore. It is. And that's exactly yeah. what he does. He only runs his, uh, his AC only if he's plugged in. He mm. also, uh, old school status, he also uh, carries a generator. Mm. yeah uh nice. so, yeah so what we did with that one the dometic penguin is i think he rented like a like um some sort of dolly that like had so the one like, you like crank yes yes exactly yeah. uh, nope. and i have footage yeah, of it you I'll look like the it. wicked witch from like wizard of oz da, 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 yeah. da, 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 like i believe up. i have footage and i'll put it into this video and and uh, that is one way to actually put that ac up there i believe yeah. we rented it from home depot my favorite is just finding like a brick wall that brings you to like chest height with the van and just back the van up to it and then just kind of <laughs> poop it on top. That, um, so that is really the hardest part, especially if you're a DIYer out there. How the heck do you so. get this thing up there? And, and then everything else is pretty much cut and dry. Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, it's running the large gauge cable can be tricky. Okay. Um, just because it's really What is big. the size of the cable? I use like zero gauge. So two zero gauge wow. cables which is one yeah. positive, one negative. Precisely. Yeah. And, and you can be sassy and you can run two positives and two negatives that are smaller and then still terminate them together. That's very, very acceptable and common in the marine industry. I've been working with Nomadic the last year or so to kind of continue to experiment with how to make those terminations from the unit to like zero gauge. And, and so kind of at that point, what they give you are these big like stainless steel hollow blocks that you stick the cable in each end and then you screw down on a terminal with like an Allen key and just try to shove it in there as tight as you can. Okay. But what's scary about that is you've got positive and negative exposed pieces of metal that are gonna be squished right next to each other, sure. which you know is gonna cause a short, that's scary. So they give you heat shrink, they have to remember to put on before you make that termination, hit that with like a heat gun, ideally a heat gun, not like a, a blowtorch. And then I don't trust that yet because that's still 90, you know, corners that can rub against each other. I take like harness, like, you know, automotive harness tape and I wrap a bunch around that as well, just to add a second layer of protection between exposed current carrying metal hitting the other. Okay. All right, then. Did you put bracing underneath this? So it comes with bracing. Oh, it yeah. does? Yep. So the, there's four threaded bolts threaded studs that are inside the 14 by 14 hole. And then it gives you two horizontal braces to shove up in there and then add two nuts underneath it to secure it into place. And Next. everything else is pretty much, uh, is it, you know, I'm going to keep on saying it's cut and dry. Do they come with instructions? Is it like, do no, they need to come? They do not come with instructions. <laughs> so Jonathan, can you please get on that? Uh, so they have like a YouTube video now, which is really helpful. On their website, I believe. Yes. Okay. We were going to do an install video, but Jonathan beat us to that is really what this comes down to. That's um, sly dog. That's sly SOB. <laughs> so so I found that I like to, to put the unit up there without the cover, just because the cover itself, it the way, you know, when you're grabbing it and picking it up, it's a lot harder to get a really solid hold if you're inevitably just going to grab the cover. And to avoid damaging it, I install it in place and then put the shroud on after that using this ac unit up there and and actually trying to have a solar panel up there you're kind of taking away space from having a roof fan or a roof vent on let's mm -hmm. say a 144 or or a 136 pro master or a short wheelbase transit um mm -hmm. can this just blow as a fan and can it extract i believe it has a fan function and only goes in one motion it'll only bring air down in air down it does not take yeah if you put an ac unit and you want a like max air roof vent you're mm -hmm. really going to have to do some roof configurations yeah because really uh, you know fitting panels up there now I, me and you both do not like your standard 100 watt panels we yeah. like the commercial grade stuff uh, mm -hmm. You and I are both very Flare, involved with right Sunflare on. Solar. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I love Sunflare. They're awesome. Right. Sunflare yeah. Solar is amazing. Um, yeah. You know, and there's other bigger companies, the Solaria Cells. Um, mm -hmm. what, what other, you know, the, but those are big. So big really panels. the big three, the big three that I recommend is Solaria, LG, and LG. obviously Sunflare Explorer. 
So the problem with those are those are big panels with the exception of sun flare that gives you a wide variety of options. The other, the LGs and Solaris are big, big panels. 430 watts. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a four by eight sheet of plywood. Right. You can't, can you fit a Solaria 400 watt panel? Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. An AC unit, an AC unit and a max air fan on a 144 sprinter. No. No. So you have to compromise. And a 170, you can do it easy. Oh yeah, all day. All, my standard configuration is a nomadic in the rear, roof vent in the front, and a four thirty right in the middle. I mean that just makes sense because typically your kitchen's right in the front. You do any cooking, mm-hmm. boom, there goes your thing. Yep. Think about your roof configuration in regards yep. to having an AC unit. Is it worth it? How can I do this if it, because it is worth it? Um, mm-hmm. You know, how is this all going to work? What size panels do I get? Sun flare solar. You know, I what know. do I do there? Uh, actually, you can even contact Nick that has access to Sunflare Solar. Yeah. I actually am not a distributor, but I believe He's you an are. ambassador, I'm right? an ambassador. My whole point to this is Sunflare actually sells 100 watt panels, but they are very, oh. very, very efficient. Uh, mm-hmm. On my Jeep, I have a 105 watt panel uh, and I have a video about me testing it. And it was in the shade and had plastic on it and it was still pulling in. Uh, just under 18 volts, which mm-hmm. from a marine electrician will tell you uh, a panel pulling in that much in the shade with plastic on it is still doing pretty damn good. Well, especially for a 105 watt panel. That's almost yes. the max you'd expect from any other 105 watt panel anyway. 100%. I believe yeah. in full sun, it'll be pulling 23, 24 volts. Which is rowdy. Yeah. It is crazy. Efficiency wise, they're great panels. However, yeah. like you said, the, the LGs and the Solaria panels are also top notch. Can you fit it with your nomadic cooling and your fan? Probably not. So uh, just keep all that in mind. Um, Nick, do you want to do you want to really say anything or, or talk about anything in regards to the installing? Um, how much of a pain it is? Uh, you know how much you actually really like ACs? How much you don't like AC units? Um, mm. Kind of go into what, what do you got for me? Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, with anything, right? You're you got to use the tool appropriately. And an AC can be an amazing tool, but it's not something you're just going to have plugged in full time unless you have a kilowatt hour battery bank and a second alternator. And then you kind of have to stress about it. So second alternator and a thousand watts or a thousand amp hours of of batteries is what you're saying. And then you're going to be a happy camper. If you're in this thing for the weekend, you probably don't need a rooftop AC. Like you'll be fine. And if Uh, depending on where you live, depending on where you live. Yeah, but if you live there and you're only out for the weekend, you're probably used to it. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you could say. But, that. but again, like it's like if you only need to be in the space for a weekend, do you have the battery bank appropriate to like park in the shade during the day where you don't need solar? Or if you're in a really hot environment, put some MC4 cables sticking out the side of your van and like take unroll your sun flare or something and like put it outside in the sun to park your van in the shade. I don't think you can so like roll a sun flare, but no, you can you can store it away somewhere. Yeah, I know. But but truthfully, though, right, it's like people get in this habit of thinking about van life as it's van life and you do it this way. And the problem that I have with it is like it's it never works for everybody. You got to think of it as your van life. And if you're in Florida and you're in July. First of all, don't buy a black van, get a white van and just plan on having a bunch of portable panels that sit outside and park your rig in the shade and just be smart about it. I love how you said your van life, not like everybody like you like my van life not you like everybody else's van life yeah it's uh, all different yeah it's all different yeah mm-hmm. so. and the only reason that on instagram van life looks so cool is because for that individual they're either a disingenuine or they found their van life and it works I, for that actually very well said that the because i think a lot of people like me that get really upset with the disgen- disingenuine ones yeah um, however if i look at it from the perspective of no they just figured out van life for them exactly for them is the biggest thing so uh, mm-hmm. i do know a lot of van lifers that uh, show beautiful spots and pictures and their van is absolutely amazing uh and i know they're very genuine so that's their van life is what you're saying mm-hmm. that's perfect possibly I yeah yeah i love that you want to finish up with anything in, in regards to anything <laughs> No, I mean, belts and suspenders, use appropriate marine grade adhesive. We will have Nick on again. Obviously, he's part of the van building team at Gutted, which is uh, super awesome. Um, uh, we're going to, I'll be promoting that over the next couple of months. I believe yeah. we. I will start- too, to my like 
1800 followers. It's funny. I believe you're the only one on the team that is not a social media <laughs> influencer. Yeah. I'm the only one on the team that probably doesn't check how many people follow me on Instagram every day. <laughs> Have you changed your Instagram handle yet? Yes. So my Instagram handle, everybody calm down, get up, get your phone. It's exploration.vans. So exploration.vans with an S. Yeah. All right. So exploration.vans on Instagram. And what is your, yeah. your website? Uh, hopefully we'll be up <clears> and running by the time this video. Yeah. Comes out. I uh, mean, you can, you can go to explorationvans.co and every link just takes you back to Instagram and there are worse things in the world. So I'm not worried about it. Say your website again explorationvans.co all right so go check out nick over at exploration vans um he's very accessible uh, and i begged him not to be so accessible uh, but he's very very accessible and uh he's up in the new hampshire which is great because how many people contact me on a weekly basis asking me if uh, how to find a van builder in the in the, the east coast well there it is guys he's right here in front of me and i'm I, i'm on zoom so I rarely build for people in the Northeast. So if you're from any other part of the country, ship your van to me. I don't care. Yeah, there you go. That's actually very accurate. Uh, you yeah. don't have to be around uh, them to, to have your van built by them. I think we're done. I think yeah. I have no idea. I'll look at the footage and, and we'll find out how good this was. <laughs> All right, man. I, I'm going to stop recording now and I'll, I'll chit chat with you for a little bit longer. All right. Perfect. All right, guys. Uh, we will see you later.